Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for showing up for webinar four, the last and final webinar for a series of tile drainage. Uh, certainly want to thank our house for here at today at the Manitoba Egg Building at the University of Manitoba. My lovely partner in crime, a handsome man, Mitch Timmerman. Mitch? Why, Steve? You've caused me to blush well, so there early you in go. the webinar. Good thing this is uh, without visual, right? Yes, exactly. Well, we don't have the picture this morning or this <laughs> afternoon of the camel and the glasses, right. you know, so we had to do something. Well, we want to, uh, first of all, uh, we'll move on to the next slide, my good friend. Thank you very much. I've got to kick the guy in the pants here who's hitting the button. We want to recognize our partnership. Uh, without the help of the province of Manitoba, this would probably not be happening as good. Very grateful for all those who have assisted us over the last three webinars. Uh, we're excited that um, we are going to be able to give you a good conclusion. This presentation based on policy and local government is certainly important, but our partners have been the, you know, the Eastern Interlake Conservation District, the LaSalle Red Boyne, the St. Rat River, the uh, LaSalle, I said that one already, the Pemina Valley, that's Cliff, and of course, uh, Arby, the Cinnaboyne River Basin Initiative. And without this partnership, uh, this wouldn't be happening. So we want to certainly thank all those who have assisted us over the last four webinars, and we'll continue to move on. I want to talk a little bit about the Red River Basin Commission. Um, the basin kind of started back in around 1908 when the two sides of the board had got together and they wanted to find a way to address the issues of water management and water quality in the Red River Basin. And uh, soon after that, I believe almost one year after, they started and participated in the International Joint Council. And from there, about 33 years ago now, the actual Red River Basin, as you know it today, has started where grassroots groups, uh, the local citizens, the municipalities, the counties, the province and the states got together to uh, start working on issues collectively together. They felt it was really important. I mean, as our local cities working together to achieve common goals for water protection and water management within the Red River Basin. And since then, we've uh, developed uh, different organizations on both sides, and we want to say again, it's been the partnership that has created the success. And without the North chapter and the South chapter, at least in the Manitoba portion working together, this probably wouldn't be going on today because they are offshoots of the Red River Basin and they are strong financial supporters of what we're doing here today. And if you look at the slides, you can see they were all together pushing the bus. Those are the kind of partnerships we need because that's actually what got the bus out. But lots of good educational pieces, September 15th event at the Children's Museum on climate change, working together with uh, all our partners. Uh, you can see Minister Clark down on the far right side those are the partnerships, those are the successes, and that's what the Red River Basin is, bringing everyone together. So in this session, uh, what does tile drainage mean for the municipality? Uh, where do we start when it comes to uh, creating policy? And what's been done in other municipalities? We're gonna really hear a lot from our conservation districts today. You can see them all listed. We also have the Arma Dufferin here. Uh, George Gray will be uh, presenting on all the hard work that they've done. And then we'll follow up and close with uh, Sherry and Jeanette, and they will talk on the provincial side regarding licensing and what's the role of the municipality. So with that, we'll get uh, started. We'll hand the conversation over to Arman. Arman is the uh, manager of the Eastern Interlake Conservation District, and there you go, sir. Hey, thanks, Steve. I'd like to thank Steve and Allison for these webinars. It just came at a really opportune time. We just had a sub-district meeting not too long ago, and all the talk there was, what about tile drainage? They said, you know what, Armin, you should go work with Red River Basic Commission and get some uh, webinars going. So, if not, here we are, and the final webinar. So, uh, I'll give you a background of the East Interlake Conservation District. It's along the shores of Lake Winnipeg there, and you can see we have four watersheds that we generally govern on, a total of 10,000 kilometers squared. It's home to about 55,000 residents, but that uh, fluctuates. In the summertime, we have lots of uh, seasonal residents along the shores of Lake Winnipeg. We have a lot of people moving out of Winnipeg, it seems, and there's a lot of uh, development occurring along Lake Winnipeg. The Grassmere watershed, which is kind of in o 5 j um, it takes in a little bit of the center port there. So uh, we want to know what's happening in that kind of water quality with development around center port. Uh, Netley Grassmere, you can see Willow Creek and, um, and Icelandic River. 
And all these uh, watersheds, it looks pretty simple, like it's a few wavy lines going towards a river or a lake. So at this viewpoint, you know, easy to govern. And uh, we put in uh, four integrated watershed management plans. So each one of those watersheds has a completed integrated watershed management plan that the conservation district has actions and goals to work with, but also our partners like the province, their NGOs, and municipalities. So here it looks pretty simple. But then you add on the administration layers, and you can see the conservation district is broken up into 15 municipalities, towns, villages, city of Selkirk, other towns as well. And then so uh, once you involve those uh, different uh, administration levels, you can see how uh, watershed management gets a little bit more complicated. And then also included, uh, we worked with uh, Fisher River and uh, Pegwood's First Nation up near uh, Fisher River watershed there, and also the northern community uh, like uh, of Dallas Red Rose. So working them into the effect, they're not contributing members of the Conservation District, but they were worked into the item and P. Do you have a question, Mitch? Oh, actually, Armand, I have uh, kudos to give you. I understand you have personal experience now in governance, or at least uh, attempting to fill that role you ran in the last provincial election. Oh, well. Now you have, now you have a newfound appreciation oh, of yeah. you. Yeah, it takes <laughs> a lot of work. Government yeah, yeah, it takes a lot of work, and Steve, and I uh, must compliment, uh, just Taking in all the knowledge out there is, 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 is uh, so work in, in, its, in itself. But I'm really happy to be back home. This is where this is where I feel comfortable. So this is great. And and then so you have the administration boundaries. And then if you look at the drainage system, uh, calling, we know that in the East Interlake Conservation District, there's over 4,000 kilometers of order drain, order one through five. And the EICD has surveyed most of these drains. Inventory like 70, 6,700 culverts, 144 bridges. So there's lots of infrastructure out there. You can manage, you've got the administration bar barriers. You have all of those different uh, streams and drains going through all different areas. You got water quality um, or, or other, other aspects of so the integrated water management plan has, has designated. And then, but uh, luckily in the Eastern Lake Conservation District, we have uh, LIDAR for the Fisher River and Icelandic River watershed. So hopefully it will become a little bit more simpler for us, or, or will it? Uh, when we look at it, and, um, and we could do something as a, a lighter produced drain delineation. So this is delineated drains within the watershed alone, and now it counts in all the drainage on uh, private land, maybe some drains that aren't on the order one through five, and that's 4,000 kilometers of drainage alone in one watershed. So what was the whole interlake it is now just one little area. So. And the question comes at the board level is uh, what will this other layer of drainage uh, mean to watershed management, right? So we have this layer. Can we include it on a detailed map like this? Like can that, uh, the drainage maps of, 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 uh, of tile drainage, can we include that in a map something like this so we know where they are at least? Well, uh, it may look like there's a lot of drainage, but when we run another uh, process on the, on the LIDAR data set, it indicates that about 12% of the Icelandic River watershed, it's not contributing on normal events. So the rain fills up and it doesn't find anywhere to go in. So the yellow areas are the, uh, are the contributing areas and the blue areas are, are potential wetlands. So uh, the board indicates that these are areas where we'd like to see um, uh, just monitor drainage or reduce drainage or just understand where it goes and relating to tile drainage especially. It's amazing the, uh, the, what the LIDAR can do for you. Uh, as a conservation district, uh, you're able to uh, show that 12% of that area is not contributing. Uh, if you had to send out your surveyors and do all that work, it would have taken you a long time. Eh? Yeah, it saves a lot of time, especially on, um, on if an individual landowner comes to us and asks about conservation programming, we can know and do a lot on the tabletop now and decide if that project would be feasible, if it's a wetland retention or other habitat easement areas. So it's the first thing we go to now is the LIDAR data set. Probably one of the most important tools in the toolbox for a conservation district. It definitely is. And then so in the EICD, one of the first thing uh, questions 10 years ago was what is our water quality like? So we initiated nine different sampling stations within the East Central Lake Conservation District and we've been monitoring them four times a year. And then this is a general water quality index for the nine waterways based on 22 different parameters. And as you can see, like uh, we took the liberties and put in the ones with the best general water quality indices on the left. So Fish Lake, Willow Creek, Washoe Bay, not too many, not too much activity there, um, like uh, anthropological activity. So it's uh, the headlands are wetlands and it goes through undulating creeks, maybe through some pasture area and then empties into Lake Winnipeg. But then on the right hand side, you can see where there's a lot of anthropological activity. 
Grasmere, Harks, Icelandic. So those are the areas where there's the center port development, lots of urban areas like Harks and Grasmere. Icelandic River is more agricultural area with some, with some urban areas. So you can see the general trends here. And then so I mentioned earlier that uh, we've comp completed four integrated water management plans. But uh, as you know, sustainability, it's a moving target. So every once in a while, the sub-districts come back together and they discuss other strategic topics that might not be within our integrated water management plan. So the point here is that we thought about six different things at these meetings. LIDAR, we would like to discuss a little bit more and find more solutions. Local drainage group partnerships, we're finding in the interlake, there's local groups coming together. One in Icelandic River, it's called BASIC, and they're generally forming a co-op saying, uh, we understand uh, drainage as being kind of infrastructure, and we're willing to ante up some cash to get better infrastructure within the area. And then uh, ALICE, or ALICE Tech programs. And then tile drainage. So we had a good discussion about tile drainage. And the bottom of the screen just kind of shows the, uh, the document that came out of there. So the number one question that uh, the members of the Conservation District had was, how should EIC, municipalities, planning districts, and the reason the three is there, because a lot of our board members wear those three hats, so it's easy for them to bring those three organizations together. How should these areas stay abreast of tile drainage and any associate positive and negative effects? So number one was partnership. Number two was partnership. Number three was partnership. So once again, thank yeah. Steve and Allison for throwing this together and getting the right people in the right room at the right time and being able to bring this out to a lot of other people through this medium. So yeah, we great. wanted to say for all you who are reading that small print stop is not an eye examination. You just uh, <laughs> Armin had to slide it in there to pick that piece up. And uh, just one quick point of clarification, Armand. ALICE stands for Alternate Land Use Services, a little similar to EGNS, Ecological right. Good Services a Concept, right? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Mitch. Thanks for that out. And then uh, the other point of tile drainage is the Conservation District, EICD, wants to make sure that uh, any, uh, any groups or partnerships that we have that want to promote uh, conservation drainage in any aspect, any areas that haven't been tested within the province of Manitoba, We'd like to initiate things like that, things that were discussed in earlier webinars. So with that, I'd like to thank you for having me here. Uh, in general, the CDs are very diverse. We have lots of different programs and, and partnerships. And we just want to know, will tile drainage programming partnership activities add to the value of the conservation district? So that's our big question. That's what we hope to answer with these webinars. And that's a very interesting perspective because, uh, as we know, tile drainage is just getting to the point where it's coming into your area. And um, that leads us to poll question one. Mitch. Yes, as Jackie, our illustrious webinar coordinator, will open the poll momentarily for you folks out there in webinar land if you'd there like to is. take part. I'll rattle off the question here. It is, what tools does your municipality or district have available to help drainage decision making? First option is orthoimagery, second is LIDAR, the third is both LIDAR and ortho, the fourth is land surveyors, and the fifth one is a state of ignorance. If you don't know uh, or you don't work for the municipality, then that's your answer. It is only possible to choose one based on the webinar technology that we have at our disposable disposal. So please choose the yeah. answer that's most applicable. It's more like a survey question. It is, yes. So with that, we'll ask Jackie for the rate of response up to this moment. Okay, right now we're at about 64%. Oh, well, we're getting there. That's pretty good. Typical response rate from the previous webinars was in that 70, 65, 70, 75 range. So we'll grant a few more seconds, and then at your discretion, Jackie, you can close the poll. All right. Looks like we're not going any higher than 69%, so I will close the poll now. All right. And, and the uh, results. Us, uh, yeah, what, what you see. All right, we've got 20% uh, said orthoimagery, 13% said LIDAR, 35% uh, said both, and 37% said land surveyors, and 31% said I have no idea, I don't work for the municipality. And thank you for your honesty, everybody. <laughs> thank you for the responses. Excellent. We'll now move on to the next section, and that will be handled by Mr. Cliff Greenfield of the Pemina Valley Conservation District. Cliff? Over to me. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Hopefully that's a yes. Yeah, you sound good. 
Okay, you can see on the map there, Pemina Valley is located in southern Manitoba. We're right up uh, on the border with North Dakota. And uh, our principal watershed is the Pemina River. And we share that with our North Dakota neighbors. It's about half in Canada and half in the U.S. And uh, truly an international waterway. That uh, waterway flows across the border and uh, enters the Red River uh, near Emerson, just south of Emerson. So this is... Uh, a map of our conservation district. Uh, we have seven municipalities and uh, the feature there, um, the red dots basically represent sort of different landscape features. Uh, we have some flat Red River Valley area in the east. We have the Manitoba Escarpment and in our western part of our district is, uh, is uplands with some uh, pothole region. Uh, most of our soils are, you know, are good soils uh, from imperfectly to well-drained soils. Uh, we're blessed with natural topography and uh, mostly natural drainage. Uh, we have about 50 uh, miles of provincial drains within our uh, district. Most of those are in the eastern part where you have uh, municipal and provincial drains that are, are man-made straightened channels. Uh, most of our area is suitable for wells. Our geology is uh, principally shale. Uh, bedrock and fractured aquifers uh, with some scattered uh, sand and gravel aquifers throughout that are, are generally highly productive and, uh, and good water quality. So, there we go. Um, tile has been brought into our district uh, over the last 10 years or so and uh, it's ever increasing. Um, Projects vary in size from whole fields to uh, just small areas. I'd say a lot of our projects are, you know, that 20 to 40 to 60 acres where there's a wet spot and the natural drainage and the soils aren't doing it. Um, so the, uh, the tiles are put in in sort of selective areas. Um, my mouse. So uh, this, uh, this picture is, uh, and the last one actually is courtesy of uh, Mama Tour. So MAMA, I love that, uh, that mnemonic there, uh, Manitoba Agricultural Water Management Association. That's a mouthful, but uh, they're an organization that represents industry and has been very active at promoting, uh, you know, this technology and showing people what it's all about. So the picture on the left uh, is interesting, I think, because you see a lift station and an irrigation pipe. So obviously this is uh, in potato country, a little bit sandier soils. And uh, lift stations are required, you know, where the natural topography doesn't do the job. So that's probably the case in about half of the projects. And the picture on the right, you can see a uh, tile uh, lift station outlet into a sort of a private ditch, and then it's heading uh, north and then towards a municipal ditch. And that kind of generates a question, uh, you know, should there be uh, public investment in in helping this technology work, or is this strictly a private uh, venture? And that's uh, probably a question for another webinar. Um, but in Ontario, you see a lot of their infrastructure is geared to basically tiling all agricultural areas. Yes, and perhaps that's not surprising, Cliff, considering how tile is the dominant form of drainage in that region, whereas here, historically, it's been surface drainage that has enabled the farming to occur. Right, and I guess the change uh, just due to the increase in land prices and increasing in uh, sort of the need for it to, uh, to get more value out of the land. So when tile is coming in, I think uh, if anybody knows this, if you see a backhoe show up in your neighborhood, you get very concerned, you ask questions, you wonder if they have a license, that kind of thing. So the same thing with tile. When, uh, when a tile license comes forward or if you see the equipment out there, uh, people are concerned. And these are some of the things that uh, I've heard from landowners, from municipalities, and I think hopefully all these things we're addressing through these workshops. Uh, you can let us know if that's the case, that uh, all these fears that are listed there, um, you know, can they be mitigated for? Do you have policy to deal with? Um, are they, uh, you know, valid concerns? Yes, I think they're all valid concerns, but uh, something that the technology can definitely address. So on the plus side, uh, the We've done uh, three webinars so far. This is the fourth one. Uh, there's been a lot of positive to talk about in terms of child drainage. There's a lot of benefits. From a conservation district standpoint, we think of surface water management, 
and uh, utilizing water when you have it. Uh, it seems like a fantastic technology for that. Um, really being smart about water and as long as the uh, impacts can be mitigated then uh, it's looking like uh, like a win-win. And I heard two words there, benefits and management. Both of them go side by side when we're talking about tile drains. So when you have a positive experience, um, you tell one person, like Steve had an incredible hamburger today at lunch and he, I did. he I told did. me I about it. All that. <laughs> but if you have a bad experience, you tell 10 people about it. And uh, this isn't the point of that slide. This is uh, uh, basically a situation that happened I think we could all learn from. This is a, a situation where uh, a tile was done kind of in the mid-escarpment area. And we have escarpment across Manitoba. And uh, my fantastic artwork there, hopefully you can get a little bit out of that. Uh, the brown line represents the escarpment. And you can see the infiltration line coming in. So all the uh, precipitation and snow melt gets infiltrated into the ground and uh, farmers would experience uh, where it discharges as well. You'll have seeps and springs and aquifers uh, in the ground that sometimes pop out. So this particular project, this is probably about five years old or so. I'm waiting for Jeanette to nod her head and uh, this was a problem that uh, a tile was put in and there was a lot of discussion ahead of time. But the outlet wasn't satisfactory because it ran all the time. It was just impossible to, to lower the water table in that area. And the solution that uh, they came up with was basically extend the outlet. So the outlet was extended to an area uh, that fed into a natural creek. And then that wasn't a problem after that. Uh, but before that, it was a significant problem for the municipality. They had icing of culverts and ditches and yard sites below the site. And uh, through that, um, the RM has really looked at this seriously and has uh, looked at changing their policy. Uh, I think originally it's just uh, go ahead, uh, do the tile, but if you have a problem, fix it. And they were also concerned about that in terms of uh, gates. So they would like to see gates on tile that if there is a problem, they don't have to wait till the next construction season. They can close the gate and alleviate the problem. So those are real learning experiences. Again, there was a kind of a negative uh, experience that turned into a positive and a lot of learning happened along the way. I think those experiences are what the webinar is all about because we want to be able to share them. Exactly. I think uh, at a workshop at Intermountain that was uh, the same kind of concern where uh, in these areas of uh, seeps and uh, springs if they get tiled, uh, you know, what can result. So this slide uh, talks about one of the products that uh, conservation districts develop and it's uh, a surface water management plan as part of uh, IWMP. Uh, Armin mentioned that all his watersheds are covered by integrated watershed management plans. And they will have, to some extent, a surface water management plan that deals with the, the management of water, uh, points out where the focus areas are, where the problem areas are, and also the sustainable development department engineers work on it in terms of identifying uh, water retention sites and, uh, and other maybe problems that the engineers can work on. But at the very basic level, it points out areas that if you're regulating um, drainage or drainage licensing above these points, you're aware of them. So this is a bit of advice, I guess, in terms of uh, policy for conservation districts and municipalities. Just from our experience, I don't consider myself uh, an expert, but I guess I know who they are. I talked to Mitch and uh, our engineer that we worked with from time to time that worked on the first couple webinars, uh, Bruce Schufeld and others. Careful with the use of that E word there, Cliff. <laughs> Some of us prefer to describe ourselves as specialists. We could oh, read okay. it. Okay. Yes, I would defer to Mr. Schufeld in terms of pure expertise in tile drainage. However, uh, you're right to draw upon many sources of information, and that's been our approach, right? Uh, these webinars would indicate that we're trying to bring people of different disciplines together, different exactly. things to offer. Right. So uh, this is some of the maybe lessons that we've learned. Um, if you are going to entertain uh, looking at uh, tile drainage applications, you know, you would consider the, uh, the, the installer and the designer, their experience, their training. Um, I think the uh, MAMA people, that part of the industry, they ensure that their people have training. And uh, it's not to say that you can't just rent a plow and do it on the weekend, but, uh, you know, it, uh, it can be done. Uh, but there are different degrees of experience out there. Uh, the province does the licensing, it is the regulator. Uh, they require an application. 
if you would look through there and if all the information that you need is in that application, that's fine. If you need additional information outside of that, you might want to look at that. And uh, the next list there is sort of the uh, things we talked about in the other webinars. Uh, these are the impacts, possible impacts. So these are considerations that uh, you need to think about. And right at the bottom, uh, design and mitigation options. That's something that both uh, Bruce and Mitch talked about in terms of, okay, we have, uh, you know, the phosphorus is great, nitrogen is a little elevated, how can we mitigate that? Uh, the salts, uh, the same thing. There are ways to, uh, to deal with that through, through design. And the Arma Thompson example, I guess it would have been nice to do that up front rather than after the fact. Um, but either way, we, we learned how to, how to do it through those things. There is a fair bit of information out there. If you want more information, you need more education. And uh, this series of webinars, thanks to the Red River Basin Commission and partners, this is a great way to start. There are other things as well, other avenues. Uh, there have been workshops held where you have the face-to-face -face with the presenters. Uh, there are some reports available. And I think both uh, Jeanette here and Mitch have gone to training outside of the province in uh, tile drainage and what's happening in other jurisdictions. Uh, child drainage research, you know, we always look to other parties for that, and uh, there is significant going on in the northern states, but also at the University of Manitoba. Uh, Mitch alluded to that in his presentation in the third webinar about Manitoba research, and I think we're going to get more of that to come. So that's, uh, that's interesting, and I, I mentioned this in my previous slide. Um, currently, we, uh, we use the Ontario Guide for Drainage as a, you know, give, uh, give us something to go by in terms of guidelines and design information. Uh, it would be nice to have a Manitoba version because we are different than Ontario. Uh, we don't have the same deep freeze or that uh, we have more of a deep freeze than they do. Uh, we have more of a salinity problem and we have things like the escarpment and the inner lake that we need to account for. So mapping is a good way to start. I think when municipalities do things, they like to look at maps and uh, maybe GIS layers. Um, so these things are available, but I don't think there's such a thing as a tile risk map. So this is new mapping that's probably required. Uh, some municipalities, I think, are working towards that um, with uh, either government or private consultants, but I think that's probably a good first place to start. And uh, if I had a nickel for every time somebody told me I needed professional help, I'd be a rich man. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no professional and that assistance. wasn't always with respect to tile drainage, no, was it? Not, but, not oh, usually. All right. How much of that was coming from your wife? Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of that. Well, uh, yeah, we'll perhaps go into that further after the webinar. Yes. So uh, professional uh, help is, is available, I think, and uh, in talking to Bruce Schufelt, the presenter for the first two workshops, he really advocates uh, a phased approach. So first you would have a map indicating low risk, medium risk, and high risk zones, and then each level would require a different amount of investigation. In a low risk zone, uh, you might need uh, very little information. In a high risk zone, you know, it still sounds like it's doable, but you might need piezometer tubes, you might need EM31 work. Uh, that type of thing. So again, this uh, drainage map, if I haven't mentioned that already, uh, the drainage guide for Manitoba, we nice to see that at some point. And just one note of caution, as I probably mentioned earlier, Cliff, that's uh, very good what you just described regarding site-specific assessment, generating a map and other products to the landowner, anyone else involved. But at the RM level and beyond, the conservation district kind of scale, we just have to be cautious because we have scale concerns with the information, how accurate is it, and then this is a fairly new subject. We have to take a hard look at how to describe a sandy soil versus a, a loam or a clay soil for risk, because it isn't just about soil, it's the hydrogeology as well. Uh, nonetheless, yeah, your statement about uh, maps, risk maps, and providing more guidance is still quite valid. Yeah, I think farmers know that, that their fields are so varied. Uh, just in a you know a poor section uh, land area, uh, you can get incredible differences. So uh, a regional map is not going to give you everything, and there's always going to be a bit of risk with it. So, and that leads us on to poll question two, Mitch. Yes, and it is a yes or no question, folks. It is as follows: Does your municipality currently have a tile drainage policy? Yes or no? And Jackie's open the poll. Thank you, Jackie. So with a simple question like that, we'll go on the assumption that a minute should be plenty of time for as good a response as we're going to see. So as we're waiting, I just wanted to say, so we're, we're seeing from one extreme, 
where we talked about the eastern inner lake where Armand is just starting to get introduced to towel drainage and they're starting to prepare themselves to Cliff uh, at Pemina Valley who certainly starts seeing a lot more activity and they need to give consideration to each case as it comes forward. So, I mean, there's a big variable there. One of our other players, which is Colin from the Crooks Creek Conservation District, I mean, where they're looking there, they have not had any applications. So you can see the extremes. We're going from one to the other. So as we'll, we go forward, you're going to see even more. So I think we probably have enough time. How are we looking, Jackie? Uh, we've got 53% voted, so I can close the poll now if you want. Let's close it and go with that. Great. 53%. Come on, guys. The question wasn't that hard. <laughs> doesn't get much more straightforward than yes, no. But uh, hey. it's a varied audience, so perhaps yeah. some did not feel comfortable providing an answer because they just don't know. All right. So our results are 15% yes and 85% no. There you go. Thank you very much with that. Well, that uh, could be uh, quite a revealing set of results and provide a good segue to our next speaker. And once I get the technology going here, we're going to advance to the next slide. Hang with me there, folks. There, there we, we go. Are. All right, yeah, so we, before we go to George uh, Gray uh, from the arm of Dufferin, Let's just say uh, Justin wasn't able to make it today. Yes, that's right. right. Due, due to illness, we'll try to uh, treat him with so, kid gloves in his absence. So, Justin, if you're at home in bed, you know, get some orange juice into you, some good vitamin C, and uh, get healthy. We'll and, talk to you again soon. And maybe plug your ears as yeah. I'm about to mis and misrepresent exactly. your Exactly. <laughs> you are now helpless. Mitch, we'll take it away. <laughs> All right. So, I did receive a briefing from Justin. Nonetheless, in the interest of time and the fact that I'm not intimate with these details, I'll uh, cruise through these fairly quickly, uh, but first, as is the pattern here today, the LaSalle Redwine CD overview is on the screen now, folks. It was formed in 2002. It has the membership as listed, it covers uh, three drainage basins and encompasses six watersheds, and there's been quite a bit of activity uh, in terms of watershed management planning and integrated watershed management planning as indicated, as well as some on the ground projects, uh, <coughs> which I shall uh, highlight, at least uh, in a modest way today. First, uh, the broad view of tile drainage, current status in the LaSalle Redboin CD. How is it looking currently? Well, Justin's provided a map on the right side of the screen uh, with the colored uh, circles as indicated to reveal where the tile drainage is still fairly sparse. That would be the orange circled area. And then generally speaking, uh, the more active areas in terms of tile drainage insulation, the purple as indicated on the map. Uh, he's provided uh, some provocative thoughts. As you can see uh, towards the bottom of the text on the screen, uh, the view from the LaSalle Redboin CD is that uh, tile is being installed at a considerable pace that is arguably beyond what science and the regulatory regime can really address. And that's, that's often the case, of course. It's, and it's up to us to try to play catch up, right? Steve? I mean, that's the point of the webinars. That's what we're here to do is we're yeah. here to learn. That's right. Stimulate some thinking, provide some knowledge, and then, yes, uh, foster research and, and regulatory response as appropriate with uh, the right knowledge. And, uh, yeah, as uh, the case was described by Cliff, uh, there have been some concerns raised and uh, some cases of, of uh, concerning situations. And uh, so they obviously require treatment site specifically in order to address them. And uh, speaking of addressing issues and providing uh, possible beneficial management practice options to, to solve any concerns, uh, Justin's put forward some questions here, as you can see on the screen, regarding specifics as far as tile drain design goes, uh, the importance of outlets and linking to the municipal drainage system, uh, water quality, as Armand mentioned earlier, and uh, Cliff touched upon fate of nutrients such as nitrogen and ph phosphorus, a subject that was uh, addressed quite intensively last week by the soil yeah. that Steve that you've come to know, so no need to dwell on that further. Uh, groundwater and hy hydrology and hydrogeology, 
uh, also of interest and uh, the hydrogeology becoming an, a, an aspect of, of emerging importance in this topic, and that's a soils guy who's saying that, who's normally focused on the top meter and change. Of course, we have to look beyond that, and especially if we're going to uh, assess the appropriateness of BMPs to mitigate child drainage concerns. So what I think is important there is that we realize that each one of these cases have to be looked upon as an individual case and a decision has to be reviewed and looked at and I think that's the way that we'll be able to create, to create that success in the partnerships we're seeking because that has to be good for everybody. Precisely and so as I mentioned this was addressed by yours truly last week and we shall allude to it again giving full acknowledgement to the LaSalle Redboyne CD's role in the Clawson project. As I probably described it last week, it's located off highway number two near Culross in a clay soil where the tile water does flow. And the interesting aspect to this tile project, the innovative aspect was what the CD supported and that was the inclusion of a water retention component. And uh, that's what uh, Justin is describing here first on the map and now with a jazzy overhead view to which I didn't previously have access to. He's got the toys to do that. Oh, yeah, wow. it's, pretty, it's, pretty clear. That. it's pretty clear. Wow. I need to negotiate with Justin for use of this photo <laughs> in my, my presentation. So as I described briefly last week, the tile water is uh, first sent into a small collection pond and then pumped as needed up to the main reservoir and as you can see from the overhead view, uh, there is the uh, local drainage network and uh, an indication as to how the water level in the main reservoir can be managed. I think what's important to look at here is that an application was sought by the farmer and when it was reviewed a resolution was found and the win-win is for all sides. Mm -hmm. That's right and as I described last week, yes, the farmer's excess moisture problem was addressed by the tile and uh, due to the limitations of the local drainage network, the farmer uh, was uh, motivated to pursue an innovative approach that may actually also offer some environmental benefits as well, water retention being an emerging topic of discussion in the province. And so Justin's provided some details here. I, I won't go over them line by line. Uh, just know that uh, he'll be glad to elaborate on the project and uh, he does acknowledge uh, what I described last week in that is the University of Manitoba's involvement in collaboration with the U of Waterloo in terms of water flow and water quality implications, surface versus subsurface flow. And uh, again, to emphasize the innovative aspect of this, uh, the real appeal was the fact that the water retention uh, became part of the mix and uh, that the landowners interest and motivation in this uh, takes it out, out of uh, the ordinary kind of thinker to entertain this kind, kind of alternative uh, and the, the motivation of the local circumstances and this was where again the theme of partnership comes into play the role of the CD the landowner and now we've got researchers and government uh, funding Environment Canada and provincial funding through going forward to make it all possible. So that leads us to poll question three. You got the paper there? I am ready here, sir. The third of our poll questions is as follows, Steve. Name the conservation district that supported the addition of an on-farm water retention component to a tile drainage system installed near Colorado. Yeah, and that the is a <laughs> could be. You're going to give the answer. Oh, yeah, yeah. sure. I guess I suppose I'll give the options. Yeah, yeah that's that a good thing. They can should, see them, but we should, want to read them, you know. <laughs> They shouldn't really be necessary considering the, the location of this question in the sequence here. But the options are Eastern Interlake, LaSalle Redboyne, Pemina Valley, Cooks Creek, and St. Rat River. And this is the question which is kind of putting you to the test to see if you're paying attention. Were you paying attention? That's, we that's just really the nature of that question. We yeah. see that Jackie has opened the poll and hopefully you guys are all there pushing your buttons soon to give us an answer. So I think so far it's been good. We've got three perspectives from three different conservation districts, yes. all starting to deal with it. And it's, it's important that the listeners out there see what's going on in the basin. This is what we want to bring to attention, but it's just not the basin. This can be reflected in the Assiniboine River or any other part in Manitoba or within the country itself. And later on, we're going to hear from the Roseau River Watershed District, and we are going to get a U.S. example. 
And I think it's good that we also hear that. So what are we looking at? How it's being dealt with? And what are the solutions to create that partnership? That's what it's all about. How are we doing, Jackie? Uh, we're at 66%. I think we're good. We'll keep on going if we could. All right. So here are the results. 90% said LaSalle Redboyne. Oh, gosh, thank you. That's excellent performance. We love you guys. Yes. Woohoo! All right. Okay, so we're going to keep that, on going. Yes, we can now move on for that uh, perspective I was alluding to earlier, uh, that special perspective that's coming from George Gray Reeve of the Arm of Dufferin. The floor is yours, George. Thank you very much for inviting me today, and welcome to webinar land. Uh, I'll start my, my, my uh, talk off on by telling you it's a very distinct pleasure to be in the webinar series, and each segment that I'm going to present today has focused on a specific part of tile drainage and how it affects all parties involved. The last segment is no different than it identifies the cumulative total of all the four segments. It's just, it's just a, a, a roll up of all the, all the four segments. What we will do, what we'll be doing today is focusing on policy and local government considerations. I will attempt in the time allotted to portray our perspective on tile drainage. When I say we, I mean the Arm of Dufferin. We formulated a policy a number of years ago. The Reeve at the time, Sean McCutcheon, felt because of Dufferin's location and high interest in tile and benefits to producers, we as well as the province needed a tile policy. Because at that time it was sadly lacking in all areas. Very few RMs had a policy, which we didn't either. Uh, we were embarking on a journey of tile drainage. And uh, you know we sort of knew where we were going, but we knew we had to have some sort of a policy. This policy is accessible on our website uh, and has been referred to as a guideline by many RMs in the province as well. And it's under surface and tile drainage policy. If you can, uh, the web, web is www.carmenmanitoba.ca and you can, you can get it at any time you want. And you're more than welcome to review it and or call the Arm of Dufferin of which we can assist you in any of your uh, journeys. And we want to thank you very much for that, George, because it is important for us to share knowledge, right? That's how we're going to learn. Absolutely. And partnership sharing is how the cooperative effort, how the success stories are written. I will now go through a presentation prepared to outline our policy challenges. Afterwards, I will wrap up with the reasons why policy is so important and how good policy will result in good results. Okay, the first one is fairly straightforward. It just says uh, tile drainage. It shows your uh, when you do the uh, the outlet, the end of the excavation, and the and the field approach at the half mile. It's fairly straightforward. And here I'll just I'll read part of it. The council shall require copies of tile drainage licensing to be completed prior to commencement of the installation of tile drainage. Absolutely imperative to the success of tile. Everybody has to know what's going on, and we we do not allow the plans have to be in by June first. You know, we're a little bit flexible on that, not much. And the final date uh, for ratification is August 1st of the same year, before they will be allowed to tile. Anything after that, uh, it, it, it'll, we, will, we will grant it, but it has to be under special circumstances. The application shall be dated, shall have the designer's name and contact information, and shall have the installer's name and contact information. And everybody has to sign off on it. We review it. Our, uh, our, our foreman, our counselor, and possibly myself, and the tiler, and the owner, in some cases, will go do, a, do an on-site inspection and make sure that all the uh, facets of the application are correct. In, in the diagram to the side, you can see where uh, the, the tile has been installed, outlets, and everything. It's a very graphic model. The drainage coefficient of tile shall not exceed one quarter of an inch in our, in our estimation. I know the, the province uh, says three eighths is the uh, is the is the level, but we have. We have any of that issues, we, we lowered it to one quarter. And we will not allow perforated drains under any circumstances unless it's on a, on a high ridge somewhere that we know full well there aren't going to be implica any implications of it. And the illustration shows our gravity outlet to the left and a pump outlet and a buried pump outlet. We encourage pumped outlets, gravity flows are fine, but they do not allow any uh, reason. That was main drains you were referring to that, Correct. that are not allowed to be perforated. The, the main drains are not allowed to be perforated. Understood. And here's a here's a typical example of erosion when uh, things are not in the middle, when things are not done properly. On both sides, you got rock culverts, and that that's imperative 
the success of the operation. The license holder of the child drainage may be responsible. We have changed that to must be responsible for mowing and mains and ditches downstream of all tile limits. They are very good. We have great tilers in our area and they, they do their best to mow. And the, with the cattails, as you can see in the left uh, slide, cattails are becoming a real issue. But mowing is absolutely imperative that it be done. Tile drainage water should only be discharged into a natural grass waterway. Provincial or municipal drain shall not cross private land without prior approval. That's like downstream uh, notification application. Uh, it, it's, it's just an absolute must that, that those sort of things be followed. And we, we like to direct our, our tile water into a, uh, a main waterway, whether it be a main ditch or a river or whatever, uh, as quickly as we can. And one of my examples later on, I will, I will itemize it and show you how su successful that can be. Uh, slide, uh, where possible, tile water should be part of an integrated water management strategy, including drains and irrigation. Very graphic model of how a, a, a portion of land can be tiled, and it, it, it's almost like a, it's almost pretty as a picture, the way, the way it's been done. Tile drainage project requiring modification to existing municipal drains shall be the sole responsibility of the applicant and shall comply with a private drainage works. We've had, a, we've had a private drainage works uh, policy in place for a number of years now, which allows uh, the farmer to apply to us. He signs a document, and he's allowed to do the, all the, uh, the changes of the, of the specific area under his, uh, he has to pay for it. We oversee it. Our foreman looks, at, looks after it, and it also uh, frees up, you know, the arm and we're responsible for it, but it doesn't cost us anything, and it allows the farmer to get it done more expedient and more, more quickly. So what I liked about your comment, George, is that you said earlier you had some great tilers, and based on the fact that the RM has come together to build the, the bylaw, it's been that cooperation partnership that's created this, right? Oh, very much so. They, uh, you know, it, it's just a great experience. The tile's a real success story, but it's only a success story by the, by the cooperation of all the, all the three components and, and, and the province as well, and uh, all, the, all the people who are involved in it. Failure, but there are some ramifications, there are some uh, penalties. Failing to comply with the above rules and regulations in regards to surface or tile drainage shall be subject to the Army Duffer Drainage Enforcement Bylaw and all fines, penalties, and sanctions that may be applied by the province of Manitoba. Uh, you know, there are some things that we, uh, we frown upon if it's not done properly. Okay, well, that's fine. Thank you very much for hitting that, George. That will be our segue. I think what, what we've, we've heard here is that, uh, you know, Dufferin has experienced a lot of tile drainage, and, and with that experience, they've had to work alongside their suppliers and, and make things good for everybody. So we really want to thank you for that presentation. It was really good. And you have more? Yep. Okay. <laughs> What, once you get a guy like George going? No, no, that's fine. That's too, it's too good. Okay, we, we so, need so there, is, there is yeah. some, yeah, he wants to. Uh, just some two examples of the, of the, uh, what we did. As I mentioned, the producer benefits are sizable. However, management of the water that enters the RM grid has its issues. In some cases, during a large rain event, the wa tile water and surface water become opponents in a rush to get to the RM drainage system. We currently have, in one particular instance, of four miles of ditching and tile with tile water as well as surface water that enters a ditch, and the timing of the rain is a perfect storm. As they buy for the for the uh, for the ditch, as a result, flooding, backup, etc., occurred. In that area, all tile exits are gravity with no control, with no way to control the flow. In hindsight, pump outs in a lot of instances would allow the water to be controlled and mitigate downstream damage. That is where policy becomes important, and that's what it's all about. All tile applications as they move into the future will need to be scrutinized more closely. The RM ditches are becoming saturated, for want of a better term, with cattails as a direct result of tile water as the ditches are kept wet all summer. This burden is shared by the producer and the RM to try and control the cattails by mowing. It is an ever-increasing problem that ditches need to be cleaned more often due to the buildup of residue. As evidence of the financial improvement for the producer, during the above mentioned rain event, it was clear as we drove around where the tile water was. Tile seals were virtually water free while on adjoining land without tile, the seals were partially flooded. Clearly to the producer's tile is very effective. 
Land values have exponentially increased in Dufferin recently. With the advent of a tile, this has had an effect. We as an RM have a challenge in deciding how to recoup our infrastructure costs to keep ahead of the competition between the tile and surface water. Assessment may enter the picture as high land values does increase the tax base. Another example of how the RM in conjunction with the owner and or renter and tile installer have to have a clear understanding of what wants to be accomplished. We had an instance in Dufferin where a section of land was applied for tile installation. The tile and owner wanted to dedicate all the tile water into one ditch. This ditch was already full of surface water. We made the conscious decision to allow one quarter section of the section to enter the ditch. But only when the other three quarters were, when the other three quarters were tiled, they had to be directed into a nearby creek in another RM with all permits to be in place prior to install. In this case, we had to be very clear in our approval in defining how it was to be handled. There was some push on the part of the tile and the owner to circumvent the agreement. We stood firm and would not allow the exit or the approval of the quarter section to be used until the other agreement had been taken care of. This, this was a case of water management policy as guidance and the determination to bring the agreement to a successful conclusion for both parties. As a result, the three quarters of the tile water was drained as directly as possible into the nearby, nearby creek with specific guidelines to use the pump out. Just a success story on both sides. In the one instance, uh, that was prior to us doing our, uh, our, our tile drainage policy, so it caused some issues. The second one, we had a very firm grip on what we were doing, and everybody followed the guidelines. And if anybody's interested, uh, you're more than welcome to call us uh, and get copies of our tile drainage policy. Thank you very much, George. I, I think it's uh, really great that Duffin will take the time and share that with everybody. Um, you know, it is the factor of us working together to create that, so thank you very much for that. So up next is that uh, we're going to go over to Jody. Staying Rat River Conservation District, how are you today? Great, thank just, you, Steve. You know, no problem. Just so you all know, there's nine of us in a room, so when you hear the bannering back and forth and all the movement and stuff, it's uh, we're having a pretty good time here. We wish you were with us, but we're going to leave you with uh, the pictures in the in the verbal stuff. So uh, take it away. Great, and um, thanks so much for having us here, and thank you very much for sharing all that, George. We've really used the arm of Dufferin. We've given it out um, multiple times to anyone in our municipalities that have been asking for tile drainage policy because tiling is uh, a lot newer in our southeastern area than it has been in the west. So it's just great to hear you speak on that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Great. So, yeah, like I mentioned, we are in southeastern Manitoba here in the St. Rat River Conservation District. There we go. <laughs> Uh, down there in the corner. So, <laughs> thanks. Uh, we were bordered with the Red River on the west, uh, Sandy Lands Escarpment to the east, Cooks Creek uh, to the north, and City of Winnipeg. And then down in the south, we have the American border, and we do share an international watershed as well um, with the Rosa River Conservation District on, well, the Rosa River watershed in the south, which uh, Torin will be talking to next. And here it is in the pink, that's the Rozo, that's the International Watershed. And then to the north of that, you have the same, uh, the same, the very north, and then in the middle is the Rat in the Marsh. So together we have about 7,000 7, square kilometers with about 70,000 people with a population that keeps increasing between uh, 15 and 20 percent in the rural areas and uh, over 30 percent plus in some of our uh, urban areas like uh, city of Steinbach, the town of St. Anne, uh, town of Niverville, and the village of St. Pierre. So quite a lot of expansion that we're ex experiencing. And uh, we've got two, two integrated watershed management plans completed for the Rat Marsh and the Seine River. And we're currently working on the one for the Rozo watershed. So that, um, those integrated water management plans like Armand was mentioning and Cliff was talking about, they all have um, areas in there that they identify surface water management concerns and issues and how to address the priorities there. So tiles come up in a couple of them for sure. And we're looking at, um, yeah, we're looking at the difference, the difference that the Conservation District of the St. Route River is part of. So these are the eco-regions eco of Manitoba and there's five of them. And most conservation districts have about one or two eco-regions. However, uh, the St. Route River Conservation District has three. We, we are part of um, the interlake right in the middle, believe it or not. 
Uh, we are also part of the Prairie Plain over on the west and the Boreal Lake of the Woods closer to the eastern side of it. And when it comes to the three distinct ecosystems, you can actually really see, uh, see the evidence of that when we do our planning. Because every ecosystem, ha eco region, has uh, different solutions regarding water stewardship and what's best for management. Um, so if you look at the elevations of our district, we have about 600 feet or 220 meters of, well, 190 meters of drop from the escarpment out east to till the Red River in the west. So, so you've got quite a lot of topography on the eastern edge, a lot of drop, and then it kind of flat levels out a little, more subtle falls till you get to the flatlands in the Red River Valley. And the farming areas, the, the zones definitely show that as well. So um, you can kind of see how one area can also have a swamp and a sand ridge in the same, in the same area. So, so, so when we're looking at soil types, oh, can you, yeah, thank you. Might be too far away. Um, so, so here's a soil type map with our municipal, municipal partners overlaid. And it, it actually really distinctively uh, describes the uniqueness of our district. The pink, very obviously, that's the clay in the Red River Valleys. The mid, mid, mid section there, a lot more silty lamb with silty loam with the gravel channels. And out, out east, the Arma Pineys and eastern Stewartburn, definitely a lot more organics that are involved there. So when, when we're looking at the interconnectivity of our ecoregion here, we've got a lot of wetlands and inter, like nothing really stops flowing. There's a lot of subsurface flows, a lot of high water tables. Um, everything's really kind of coming quick off the escarpment, off the organics, and then into that silty lay, loam gravel area where it's still moving heavily surface and subsurface flows into the valley where you kind of let levels out into the flats, the fertile agricultural la land into the Red River. So, so it's, um, it, it, you know, but basically predicting the, effic the efficiency of tile drainage can be very tricky and difficult. Um, and unknown. So some of the some of the questions that we've had is that landowners are just a little unsure on, on what tile drainage is going to do to the land, landscape. So here we have um, a peatland area from Home Post in East Midlands, Great Britain. And if you believe it or not, um, so the landowner is looking up at what looks to seems to be a light a lamp post, but it's actually a post that was driven in the land into the ground back in 1851 and now has dropped, the land has dropped since it's been drained 4.2 meters. That's amazing. It's pretty unreal. Kind of looks like Narnia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when we talk about that, I mean, some of the, what are, what are the impacts of that? Well, definitely there's a collapse of soil structure, erosion of soil structure, loss of all water retention ability. And it's, it's kind of uh, a showcase of the difference between draining a prairie pothole area and a wetland network. So prairie potholes, are, those, those are a bit more segregated. They're, they're almost an individual system of a pothole. Whereas our wetland networks, we're finding they're sections upon sections upon sections that are large interconnected water flows that are coming in. So if you're tiling around one wetland in, uh, in, a, eight, in a quarter section, you could still be potentially impacting that wetland. And I think that's just an unknown for us right now, and it just needs to be further clarified. So, great example of that. So here, so the Conservation District really looks at um, surface and subsurface flows. They're really interconnected. So we kind of wonder what would happen if we did a lot more water retention in the areas that farmers are actually concerned about tiling or they think tiling would be a benefit, and we know tiling would be a benefit to the agricultural landscape. And the question comes up, well, is there an opportunity for uh, community landowners to get together and put in some money, maybe matched by the conservation district, to develop sort of a larger scale local water retention project that would benefit a dozen landowners? And is that something worth, valuable to look into? And moreover, is surface water management part, is there a place for it to be part of a tile drainage policy? And we definitely think there is. Um, definitely improving the water quality as well through the ecological fun functions of wetlands is, uh, is also something that happens with water retention. And if that's something that we're concerned, as Mitch was talking about with the LaSalle Red Point, putting water retention in with the tiling, there's definitely a good fit on a small scale, but also on a large scale. 
So what the Conservation District Board has requested, since a lot of tiling questions have come up from our um, rural municipal partners, we have actually been asked to put together a recommendations map of pretty much what Cliff was mentioning, low risk, high risk, medium risk areas for tiling. And we did that according to soil types. Again, we did a research compilation of just existing research that we had from Manitoba, Ontario, Minnesota. And we came up with a map similar to this. Well, this is one of the maps. For the, this is for the Arma Hanover. I think the title will come up. And uh, <laughs> great. And, yeah, and they actually put it, put it, put it into their policy um, for tiling, which was based off of the Arm of Dufferin. So it's pretty great. Um, again, not perfect, a lot of unknowns. But if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, there should be a circle coming up. There we go. The, um, the, the, the light blue in the top left, that area, that's definitely uh, clay, it, you know, probably low, low risk for tiling is what we call it. Um, the mid, mid area, again, fine loam, probably low risk. And then the pinker areas, the, the coarse loamy, definitely tile with care. And then the sandier organic areas that we know have a higher water table is an area that we wouldn't really generally recommend for tiling. So these maps we've made available to all of our municipal partners and they're definitely, <coughs> anyone that's interested in putting together a tile policy has uh, really received them well. And if there's any way that we can enhance them and support, support the partners better, uh, we're willing to do that too. So the one thing that we like with the Arma Hanover is they're, they're very innovative in uh, water retention, um, I guess, piggybacking with tile drainage. So they definitely have that surface water intent going. And they look at it as a money saver. Like obviously there's sustainable benefits and ecological benefits, but there's, there's, there's a lot of money being spent on drainage. And if you can spend a small portion of that on retention, you're going to save on the drainage aspect of that. So um, it's something that's great for us to, to work with. So there's the link to their website. That's fine. You can get on the, on the, uh, <laughs> yeah. quick, quick a great screen. There we go. Yep. So a here's the our Montcom. So they've also put together a fairly in-depth uh, policy on surface and tile drainage. And again, that's come up. They've got a lot of tile requests in their area. Um, the next uh, map shows we have basically the the eastern portion of Montcom in the top right corner. That's part of the St. Art River Conservation District. And then the bottom left, that's actually uh, not in a conservation district at the moment. Um, there is none in that corner. But you can kind of see they straddle the Red River. So they're right in the Red River Valley. And they've got a lot of clay and fine loam. So again, basically their, their soil types are pretty uh, low risk for tiling. But the one thing is that they put into their policy is making sure that there are restriction restrictions put on the tiling, um, similar to what the RM of Dufferin has presented. So it's, um, it's really been a lot of questions around tiling, but I think that um, this is great discussion to have. So I just thank everybody for being part of this and for having us. Thank you very much, Jody. Really appreciate that. And uh, Jackie, we're actually going to uh, go back to you and uh, get Torin on the line. Torin, you there? He's presumably unmuting his line right now or else hopefully Jackie has to enable that. No, I think he should be good to go. Okay, Torin? There he is. Yeah, okay, on. so you'll just give us a little signal and we'll flip the screen when you need the uh, change and you're good to go. All right. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Torin McCormick. I work down in Rosa River, down on the state side, uh, just south of Jody's district. And I was asked to kind of give a, a rundown of how we came up with our policy and how we address tile drainage. Um, basically, it all kicked off for us back in 2012. Uh, the BT SAC briefing paper number two on subsurface drainage came out and kind of uh, kick-started a lot of watershed districts in the Minnesota side of the valley looking at uh, whether or not they wanted to elect jurisdiction or enforcement of tile drainage and uh, permitting or licensing as it might be called on the north side. Can you go to the next slide? So we developed some information that we would like to see in our permit applications. In the very basic uh, drainage coefficient, uh, we prefer a quarter inch drainage coefficient much like uh, the other presenters had noted. Um, we have had a couple that wanted a little 
better drainage as far as from the producer side. We pretty much steered everybody away from that. I don't believe we had any that we've approved that were higher than a quarter inch. We look at the tile spacing, tile size. Um, we're very big on a form of control of the outlet so that the landowner has the opportunity to shut off or at least meter back the water as needed. And then of course armoring the outlet and the big thing we always look for is anytime you change something on the landscape, what's the effect on the existing drainage network, the adjoining properties, the infrastructure, and other other aspects of the community. So next slide. So we looked, we took VTSEC's suggestions. We looked at the information provided from um, the University of Minnesota and other organizations that had done some research on the issue and we decided to set up some stakeholder meetings. We uh, we noticed um, producers in the area that had either installed tile or were interested and we were aware of that. Uh, we got one of the local designers and installers out and a couple agency personnel as well as some of our board of managers. We had a series of meetings and discussed um, issues as far as the tile drainage, concerns that landowners had, concerns that installers had as far as requirements for design, uh, requirements for installation, how in-depth the licensing would be for that aspect, and we kind of came up with a policy based on the discussion with the board or with the, the stakeholder meeting. So we reviewed the policy and then eventually the watershed adopted it and then elected permit authority. So in, on Minnesota's side, there is no standard as far as watershed districts, conservation districts, or water management boards being required to enforce. It's more or less you can elect or just uh, let it go unpermitted. Basically, there is no set standard at this date and time. It has been discussed in the past, but nothing has come through as of yet. So your next slide. So this is kind of a, um, this graphic shows some tile that was installed in the southern reaches of our district. Basically, we when we ask for these, these permits, we get the permit application, which will be on a, a following slide here. We ask for a layout. Um, we do a typical or a, a very general geo-referencing exercise where we actually input this into ArcGIS. So we have a layer and each one of the tile lines has the attributes of the tile size. We have the outlet locations, we have the mains, we have pretty much any information that we can find pertinent. So that way, one, it's just a good general base information layer. But we also have the opportunity if there's future modeling efforts, if there's issues that come up, we have this information on file that we can draw from at a moment's notice essentially. This is a copy of our permit application. It's it's pretty simple. Um, that was kind of the the consensus of the stakeholders meeting and the the board as a whole. Um, we essentially wanted you know a set of plans, some very basic information, but not we didn't want uh, you know a drawing on a napkin. But we didn't need engineers' numbers down to you know, the brass tacks. So essentially what we came up with was a lot of the stuff I mentioned before. We set some limits to land sizes, what we were we would require to have uh, drain tile on. We set the limit at 20 acres because we did know that there were properties, farmyards, um, bin sites that were 10, 15 acres where they were looking at putting tile in under the gravel just for the purposes of keeping their base dry on their drives. And we felt that that wouldn't fall under the same policy as uh, drain tile for agricultural practices. So we had to kind of disseminate that out. Uh, we also put in criteria in there about flood events and then some language to basically state that if, if there was an issue, we still reserve the right to have that tile shut down. So if there was issues with damages downstream, uh, culverts freezing up or, or creeks overtopping and freezing on the roadways causing hazards, we had that, that flexibility to basically ensure that the landowner sees what they're doing for the greater good of the community. Next slide. So <laughs> basically the goals, uh, these are kind of 
uh, redundant to some point is basically to promote the sustainable agriculture practices, um, longevity of farms, uh, promote best management practices, which is a buzzword used down here a lot, basically making sure that we don't make things worse, um, stabilizing banks, stabilizing outlets, making sure that whatever we do, we're, we're making things better and the end result. Um, like I said before, reduce the localized flood damages. Um, before we really adopted this policy, there were a few systems that had been installed and they resulted in some issues with some neighboring landowners. And that was uh, akin to some culverts getting eroded away at and some issues with some discharge rates. And then the last part, uh, assisting landowners in their decision making. We have had quite a few people that have come in with the general idea and essentially left here deciding that they didn't want to install drain tile because we sat down and started going through the process and they looked at the features of their property and realized maybe it wasn't an economic benefit that they were being touted by the, uh, the industry. So that's kind of a, a quick and dirty of how we do things down here south of the border. I included some links as well um, to the U of M, uh, the Basin Decision Information Network, which is always a tongue twister for me, and then our website. So if people want to look up some of the information that we've kind of based our our decision making off of, it's there. So other than that, that's pretty much what I got for you. Well, we're very grateful for that. Thank you so much, Torin. Uh, we want uh, it's good to hear a perspective from the U.S. side. We want to keep on moving as um, we're watching the clock, and we know all you probably want to hit the door in a while, so we'll move it right over to Jeanette. Uh, Jeanette is going to speak to us regarding the Water Rights Act. Jeanette? Hi. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Jeanette. I'm the Senior Water Resource Officer for the eastern side of the province. The Water Rights Act tells us that uh, you can't control uh, water or construct, establish, or maintain any con water control works unless you have a valid license. And tile drainage is considered a water control works and therefore requires licensing under the Water Rights Act. It's um, basically any surface or subsurface activity requires a license. Oh, we've already gone into poll question four, Mitch. Just to keep this things lively. <laughs> So, uh, yes, for all of you attentive folks out there, it should be quite obvious the answer uh, is uh, either true or false, but the question is, do you require a water rights license for a tile drainage project? <laughs> and you should have the answer if you were listening in the last <laughs> one minute. Surely, surely Jeanette had your full and proper attention. I see Jackie has the polls open, and you folks should be just tabbing on those answers because it should be quite simple. So, Jackie, are we going fast here? Uh, we're uh, about 65% right now. 65. Let's keep her going, my dear. Give us the uh, give us the readout. Sure. Okay. Yes. We'll close the poll. All right. Here we go. 100% true. Oh, All right. Bravo, Gold Jeanette. stars for everybody. Yeah. Woo. Woo. All right, Jeanette. Well, I don't have to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be able to breeze through this part. Huh? Yeah. So. In order to apply for a water rights license, you need a complete um, completed application, as well with a um, the license fee, which is $25. And there's two places that this can be sent in, and that's in Winnipeg or Brandon. And your applications can be obtained from the regional offices, the water resource officers, or on the World Wide Web. <laughs> <laughs> or the website. There you go. And there's the website. <laughs> Just look for the bike. Yeah. Part of having a completed uh, license or application, it includes the legal land. The legal land description, the number of tiles or number of acres to be tiled. Um, this would include the location, size, and flow direction of the lateral pipes, including their depth, um, pipe gradient, and details about the connection between the lateral and header pipe. 
The header pipe would include the uh, location, size, depth, and outlet location, as well as flow direction. The proposed runoff coefficient, which should not exceed uh, 3 eighths. Most of our projects are coming in at quarter coefficient. Um, the coefficient and the system design shall include the proposed system runoff uh, in CFS usually. And the header pipe outlet is to be designed so that an operational control structure may be installed if required. The um, header pipe depth should be an average and non-perforated and no more than uh, 60 inches. There's a design there that shows all of that information. Thank you. Um, all of the tile outlets require, are required to be rip-wrapped and marked with a visible bullard, antenna, or any other means to identify it um, so that the affected municipalities or ourselves or the um, conservation districts can find the outlets easily. Additional, the flow control, flow contro control structures may be required on pipe outlets. The location and type of operational flow uh, must be detailed in the license. In higher land slope areas where the overall system um, exceeds 30 inches, there may be additional flow structures that are required within the lateral pipe. We've seen lots of good examples of that through the last uh, bunch of webinars. Yeah. Additional requirements um, for systems outletting into the municipal drain within one mile um, and stays within the municipal, municipal drainage system, written approval from the affected municipality is required. The municipality may require additional information and that we would um, receive from them in their written um, portion or approvals. If the municipal drainage system outlets or becomes a natural waterway within two miles of the proposed outlet for um, additional landowner sign-off may be required. If the system crosses natural drains or across private property, the landowner's written approval is required, and that's for a minimum of two miles downstream. If for any system outletting into the provincial drain or highways network, written authorization from the affected government agency is required. And all tile works must have a minimum 50 meter setback from any semi-permanent or permanent wetland. And with that, Jeanette, thanks for the regulatory scene from the provincial scope. We are now going to have Sherry Griff, land use planning specialist with my department, Manitoba Agriculture. She's a special, special envoy here today from the Northway Building downtown. Thanks for coming all the way to the Fort Carey campus. Yeah. Sherry, right, the floor is yours. <laughs> Greetings from the big shots downtown. All right, yeah. Sherry, what is is the municipal role. Well, I was laughing as I was listening to George speak. I was starting to think maybe I was redundant. <laughs> oh, certainly. Because I think you did a really good job. Of, <laughs> you did a really good job Dude, of describing. I'm sure we can find something for you to do here. Yeah. He did a really good job of describing what the municipal role can be. And I'm not here to tell you what it should be, but certainly just to give you the options under the current regulatory framework in terms of what a municipality can or, or can't do in terms of being involved with uh, regulating tile drainage. So first of all, I think it's pretty clear that municipalities do have the authority to pass bylaws on tile drainage, and, and certainly the arm of Dufferin has done that and, and done that very comprehensively. The authority for this is actually under the Municipal Act, so it allows that uh, a council can pass bylaws for drainage and drainage on private or public property. So there is no question that a council can, in fact, regulate tile drainage in its municipality. The other thing that a council can do under the Planning Act is to regulate via zoning bylaw. So a zoning bylaw essentially, of course, just lists out what, with, what uses are permitted or conditional in a certain zone. So for example, if you have an agricultural zone, tile drainage could be listed as a permitted use in that zone or it could be listed as a conditional use. And also there are standards for development that can be set out as well and certain circumstances under which a permit is required. Um, 
a zoning bylaw is clear under the Act that a zoning bylaw can contain provisions prohibiting or regulating, and they actually specify removal, excavation, deposit, or movement of sand or gravel, soil, or other material for land. So again, that's clearly set out in the Planning Act. And in fact, you can even regulate the cutting and removal of trees and vegetation, which most municipalities aren't actually aware of. So what you can do then in the zoning bylaw, if you choose to regulate it in your zoning bylaw um, as a permitted or conditional use, uh, conditional use is a little different. Permitted, of course, is just listed that this use is allowed in this particular zone. A conditional use does require that there be a notification of all landowners within 100 meters of the property. So if somebody comes in with the with a conditional use application, uh, the municipality will set a hearing date, public hearing. Anyone can come. They can speak for. They can speak against. They can ask questions, and the applicant can provide the information and, and hopefully answers to those questions. And then when the municipality hears the public hearing, they can set conditions on development, including development agreements, which can be um, financial in nature, and uh, municipalities can, can ask for, let's say, you know, well, you did in terms of mowing, certainly in the arm of Dufferin, but there are other things they can ask for as well in, in terms of cost sharing, et cetera. The thing to note on a conditional use, of course, is that a council decision is final. So there is no appeal, and, uh, you know, it does involve a public hearing, so that may be something a municipality wants to consider if they decide to go this, this route. Certainly what we've seen mostly so far has been um, the municipal bylaw. And again, municipalities can issue development permits. So even if something is listed as a permitted use in a zoning bylaw, a municipality can require that a development permit be issued. And that means that the council knows exactly what's going on. And the reason they can do that is, again, development is defined under the Planning Act as the removal of soil or vegetation from land and the deposit or stockpiling of soil or material and land and the excavation of land. Most municipalities, of course, have building permits. Uh, every municipality has a building permit, but not all municipalities use development permits, and certainly that is something that is available to them. Not to be paternalistic, but I just want to put something forward. And again, like I said, I, I certainly it's up to the municipality to determine how they want to get involved. In, in regulating tile drainage in their particular municipality. But you should be aware that the province is responsible for regulating the environmental aspects of the development. And as Jeanette just presented, there is a, certainly a regulatory component for which the province is responsible and, and of which municipalities really should be aware. The other thing I want to note is that municipal bylaws and regulations really need to focus on the municipal issues. And I, I do think Dufferin's has done that quite nicely. And it should not be inconsistent with provincial regulations. So if you've got something in there, make sure that you're not doing something that's inconsistent with the way the province has regulated. And that's really important. And again, that just comes with knowing <laughs> what exactly the province is requiring. The other thing I did want to mention, because I think this is so important, is really once a municipality adopts a, a bylaw, whether it's a zoning bylaw or a municipal bylaw, it is the municipality that's responsible for enforcing its own bylaws. And that's another reason why it becomes important not to sort of overstep whatever the province has put in in terms of regulation. Just ensure that if you have adopted a bylaw, that it is enforceable. Whether that means consulting a lawyer or talking to the province, again, that both avenues are available to the municipality. The reason I raise this, <laughs> uh, the Arbor Report for Prairie, this was in 2015, like 2015, this sort of started. They did adopt, I'm not sure if they did it through a bylaw or a pass by resolution, but they did approve tile drainage on four separate, for four separate applications. And in every case, they made it contingent on no manure being applied to the land afterwards. And this is not consistent with the Planning Act. The Planning Act is pretty clear that you know, municipalities should not be really regulating manure application to land because it is something that is regulated by the province under the livestock manure mortality management regulation. So is this bylaw enforceable or is this something they can actually enact if once the tile drains have gone in, someone does decide to put manure on the land? Probably not. It's probably not legally enforceable. And, you know, that's just something that really, I think, is something a municipality needs to be aware of. And not to take part shots at the Armour Porch and Prairie, because it was this thing that really got the province's attention and led to the formation of the Interdepartmental Tile Drainage Working Group. This is the, the working group that I'm involved in. Jeanette is on. Mitchell is also involved. It includes representation from the Departments of Sustainable Development, Indigenous Municipal Relations, and Agriculture. 
the goal of our tile drainage working group is to coordinate tile drainage initiatives, knowledge, and programming across departments so that we're all talking to each other. We all know what's going on in terms of the regulatory requirements. Certainly that comes out of sustainable development. Indigenous Municipal Relations is the department that works predominantly with municipalities on planning. And of course, agriculture, we very much have an interest in tile drainage from a farming standpoint. So with all three departments at the table, and there's a few representatives from each in most cases, um, our goal is really to improve communication and coordination. And at this point, I think we've really focused a lot on the extension. I know Mitchell has been involved in a lot of different opportunities. We have really appreciated this opportunity to partner with uh, the Red River Basin Commission on, on this webinar because I think this actually meets our goals quite nicely and, and hopefully theirs as well and again gets a really good discussion going on tile drainage and what that means in, in Manitoba. So we did form this tile drainage working group. Um, our next big uh, thing that we're involved in in terms of extension is we actually have a session uh, on the plan Manitoba Planning Conference. So we're hoping to reach out to some municipalities there. It's called the ins and outs of tile drainage, what municipalities need to know. And it will be a very condensed version of what you've seen in the webinars, but we certainly can't cover what's happened in, in the last four webinars in, in one, one hour session, but we'll do our best. Essentially, when it comes right down to it, what the tile drainage working group is trying to do, and certainly what, what we're trying to do here, I think, with this, with this webinar series, is just really get the message out that awareness is key. So if a municipality does choose to regulate tile drainage, try and do it in a way that it doesn't restrict options allow the opportunity for things to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis as needed. I mean, you certainly don't want to see something in there that actually prevents someone doing something that's actually better for the environment, or perhaps whether it's retaining water on their own land or, or some, some other measure. And whatever gets put in place should really be reasonable and practical. And we do want for it very much to be based on science, and I think that's probably what everyone can agree upon. And it's interesting that it came up in, in Cliff's presentation. He talked about the possibility of establishing beneficial management practices guidelines for Manitoba. And I know we're very aware of the ones that exist in Ontario. And that's something as a tile drainage working group that we've been talking about as well. And that's something that we want to look at going forward. Certainly, the engineering expertise is out there. Certainly, we can draw a lot of that from the Ontario guidelines and really make it applicable to a Manitoba situation with Manitoba soils. So just so you know, the province can help, <laughs> we're listening. We certainly heard when, when Portage made the bylaw or the decisions that it made that it really came to our attention that there were a lot of municipalities out there asking questions about tile drainage and wanted some information and certainly we can provide input if you do decide to go ahead with municipal bylaws, uh, whether you use deference as a basis or, or trying to strike out on your own, we're very available to provide technical expertise and tech technical input on those bylaws. Municipal bylaws are not something that province is normally involved in, but if a municipality does request that assistance, we're certainly willing to provide it because we think that's in everyone's best interest. I've left my email address on the bottom there and Mitchell's as uh, an initial point of contact. And certainly we can you know, help provide that kind of information. I know that's what the arm of Montcalm did when they went through their their recent bylaws. <coughs> so they can reach out and touch someone. Absolutely. Send we're that very email. willing to, to provide whatever assistance we can. And so I just wanted to say thank you. This is actually a little excerpt from our website. I know how hard it can be to find anything on this provincial website, even when you know exactly what you're looking for. So here is the actual link to our soil and water management page. And you can see we've got a lot of information up there that was touched on earlier, including the PAMI report um, that I believe was mentioned by Cliff. Also, the whole uh, manure and nutrient management and tile drain lands that was funded by Manitoba Livestock Manure Management Initiative. That's available from our website. And we're also going to have the, the webinars up there too. And of course, also Manitoba Sustainable Development Link to Licensing Regulation Policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sherry. Mm -hmm. And we're going to just switch over, and it's going to lead us to poll question five. And we're actually going to try to get you guys out the door at four o'clock. So, uh, Mitch, what is poll question number five, the final question? It is as follows. Would you find it useful if the Red River Basin Commission partnered with other organizations to create a tile drainage policy template for municipalities to use? Right. So I see the polls uh, open. Um, you can answer that. 
uh, we feel that uh, the basin can uh, play a great role here and that we can bring all these players together and create a bylaw template similar to all the hard work that George did in Dufferin, utilizing George because he didn't know, but he already offered to volunteer to come out. And, and, and we can supply the municipalities that are giving consideration to or within the province of Manitoba to have a bylaw in place. At the end of the day, I think what we need to look at is, is tiling good? We think it is. Can you have challenges with it? You certainly can, but working together uh, certainly makes great successes. So how are we doing, Jackie? We can close that up? Uh, yeah, we're at 64%, so I will close it All right. now. Rock and roll. All right, and here are the results. 89% of people say yes. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate the support. So I believe uh, we want to say thank you to all of you. This wraps up the fourth and final uh, webinar that has been put on. We want to thank our North chapter and our South chapter uh, for their financial contribution and helping us. Certainly want to thank our partners, the province of Manitoba, all our conservation districts, the Assiniboine River Basin, the Rosal River down there in the U.S. Thank you very much, Touring. Um, at the end of the day, folks, if we are to focus on success, we will achieve it if we all work together. But if we are apart, we will not see it. So let's continue to do that. With that, we say a farewell. Thank you, Mitch. Closing words? Oh, uh, gee. Uh, oh, I didn't catch you off guard. <laughs> no, you certainly. How, how about uh, thanks for the invitation to participate? Uh, I spared you the, the pun. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks for the infiltration. Thank uh, you very much. Yeah. Enjoy your day, and I uh, want to give special thanks closing to my partner, Allison, because she's an awesome lady and she works her butt out. So thank you, Allison. <laughs> Enjoy your day, everybody. Thank you. So long. <laughs>